they will have like two, two, two groups. You know, you walk around, we have like someone holding your hand. And I remember no one wanted to hold my hand. No one wanted to hold my hand. And when the first, I remember his name, Kai. And when the first Kai to hold my hand, he was always like, cleaning his hand on his really? trouser because he was so scared that my color would get on his fight I had with my parents because I didn't understand why I was black. Really? What do you yeah. mean by that? Yes, I, I was I was fighting, yes. Your parents? With my father. That why are you black? Why am I black? I was in UK pitching my innovation, telling them how far we got as a team, how much impact we had on healthcare access. In London, it was a room full of white people. Only one other black lady was there. But the first question was, how would you make that possible as a black woman? Why they asked me that question? Because they don't see role models like that. So he always says that when he enters the room and he knows that he's the only black person, he doesn't always see it as a disadvantage. I know we want to have diversity today, but you can't always ensure the diversity. But what you can ensure that with not being in a diverse room is that everyone will remember you. So he said whenever he enters the room and he knows that he's the only black man, he takes his advantage. So now it is up to you, or up to him, on how he made that memory last. Speak eloquent, to make people laugh, be happy, dress properly. You don't have to fit into that mindset or frame that they, or the perception that they might have from you. Hello guys and welcome back again to another amazing episode and this is the Diaspora Transition episode where uh, we have dialogue with Diaspora who decided to relocate um, either from Europe, US or other Caribbean countries and currently living here. Uh, today we do have here someone very special. Um, she's someone you might have seen here on your screen as a model. Um, she's been, you know, showing her pretty how beautiful she is. But now she's on a different trajectory uh, which impresses me the most. She's now in fintech. Um, co-founder for you know finance solution for people to be able to send money easily they've even met the president of Ghana whilst they are here and listen I have so many questions for her but first I want to find out how everything started so without further ado Gloria Adenikwe welcome on the show thank you thank you thank you thank you um, yes thank you um, for having me here my name is Gloria Nikwe and um, you've already introduced myself I'm really grateful to be here I'm a Ghanaian-born German um, fintech founder or tech founder, um, supporting access to healthcare through financial inclusion and also supporting black entrepreneurship in Germany, where we are looking into expanding in Europe as well. So yes, entrepreneur journey from a fashion influencer, modeling for Fashion Nova, Shein, to being into this tech environment. Such an exciting transition, but I love it. Yeah, yes. Fashion Nova, Sheen, <laughs> and now, that's amazing uh, transformation. Let's just go back to the beginning of your story a bit. I met you, I think, two years or so ago, in one of the events, you, were, you know, doing your thing. Um, I knew you to be a model, right? But obviously now you have a lot going on and I see it on your page. How did everything start? You were Ghanaian, where were you born? Where were your parents from? How did you even end up in Germany? And why did you choose to even relocate back to Ghana? <laughs> Pink, 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 so many questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yes, I'm a Ghanaian born. I was, I think I, I moved to Germany in the age of three years. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother is an Ewe, my father is a Ga, me Ga, Fio, my way Fio, but my accent Ingo. <laughs> yes, but the tree, please don't ask me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not a Ga, so we spoke Ga at home and, mm -hmm. um, Yes, I, I went to school to in Germany. I went to the kindergarten. I, um, I did a traineeship in finance and insurance. I have a finance and insurance background. I studied e-commerce and um, yeah, all this, you know. And with that, I think during my, during my finance and insurance journey, I noticed that there's something on social media that I can do. Mm. <laughs> Because I was, um, that's how I actually got into like fashion and, and modeling. I really love taking pictures. I remember when in my, I think I was 14, I would just pack my clothes with my friend and then we do bicycle tours and we just go to random places and take pictures. That's how it actually started. Interesting. Yes, with Facebook. So Instagram was not that thing yet. 
and then somehow when Instagram became something, I noticed that, okay, let's try it out. And I actually started as a fitness influencer, so I'm very much into fitness. I love working out, I love inspiring others to work out, and all this inspiring mindset came along with, mm -hmm. you know, with fashion, you can actually express yourself, you can, mm -hmm. you can just play around with who you are, you can, you can wear this hairstyle, you can wear these shoes, you can put things all together. And um, somehow I noticed like brands paid attention to me and that's how I got into the um, fashion, social media fashion industry, I would say it this way, because I'm not like the proper model, runway model and cover model, I'm just like, I would say social media model. And um, yeah, I, I experienced this journey a long time, like a few years, mm -hmm. you know, um, interacting with other social media influencers in the industry and but still I was very career driven so I still um, made sure that I finished my um, exams I, mm. I went to schooling I read my books and I noticed that I would I would want to be more than that I would want to be more than just a pretty face because what happened is since I was very career driven I had like a career driven um, you know, personality, and since I was very fashion-driven, I had a fashion-driven personality, so I was quite splitted. So people would see me and they would talk to me and they'd be like, oh, you are quite smart. And people would see me and, on my professional and they'd be like, oh, you're quite fashionless. And I noticed that I needed to combine that because they noticed that people didn't know who I was. And somehow, you know, when you're young, early 20s, you actually don't know who you are as well you're actually still transitioning, you're finding out who you want to become. And um, I said, you know what, I want to make sure that what I'm doing, the profession I'm, I'm doing, aligns with where, what I'm coming from and what I want to be. And, the prob and uh, you know, that's how I actually tapped into the entrepreneurial scene. So I was looking for like circles, like-minded people that are also like professional, you know, black excellence, you know. And in Germany, I, um, because of my, you know, professional appearance, um, I, I got reached out to like a community that was looking for people that are ambitious and would like to build things. And, and that's how I got to IDEA. IDEA is the Afro-German startup pitch competition. It's similar to Shark Tank um, or in Germany we have Höhle der Löwen. So we have black professionals on stage. Um, having an audience of 500 people pitching their innovations, their ideas to win an equity-free grant of 53,000 euros. Mm. So this was what we actually, that was the vision three years ago. And today we had our third edition and even um, established ourselves in building relationships with politicians and um, bringing it into st um, state level. So it became and we even have like a cooperation with Google now, so we are launching our tech accelerator. And with this circle, I also enlighten my own entrepreneurial identity, um, because I also, you know, I mentioned that I was born in Ghana. I um, experienced a very sad incident when I was a small girl, and um, my mother, you know, we left our aunties and my aunt, my uncles all behind. So my mother was desperately supporting the healthcare financing of my auntie. And that's where I noticed that there is a problem. And you know, when you get older, you notice that people in the diaspora are still suffering with similar challenges. So it comes that my mother had to send her money to secure her health. She had some very bad stomach. Um, she needed a surgery. You know, I was a small girl. I can't put it all together, but what I know was that we had to send her money. And every time when she had to send her money, she was totally overwhelmed. My mother was crying. She wasn't able to just like leave everything and just travel back to Ghana and make sure she can support my auntie in Abeka. So she was living in Abeka. But um, she was able to work. And with the little money that she had, she used it to send it and support it. And every time she was overwhelmed because she wasn't, insure, she wasn't able to ensure the money she sent was spent on its actual purpose which was healthcare. So you know how it is, when you send money, they'll take it for something else. The person who collected, they'll put some in their pocket. The person who wants to spend it for healthcare, they'll say, okay, next time when the person is spending, I'll spend it for healthcare. This time I need it for something else. This quite, you know, challenging things as well, but 
that are not prioritizing the healthcare matters. And I noticed this problem and I said, okay, we need to solve this. And we came up with Comezo, which the vision with Comezo is empowering access to healthcare and enabling financial inclusion. So you can send healthcare remittances with our solution and ensure that it can only be spent on the healthcare matters. So we have healthcare providers locally. You know, we are launching now, we are rolling on more and more healthcare providers, but the vision is to have it like, okay, you see a visa sign and you can pay with visa. So if you see the Comezo sign, you can pay with Comezo. So when you want to send money and ensure that money can only be spent for healthcare, you can use our solution. So this is the, the two organizations that I'm passionate about, that I'm working on. So I'm founding member of IDEA and supporting black entrepreneurship in Germany and ex expanding it in Europe. And I'm also um, co-founder and CEO of Comezo, which empowers access to healthcare and financial inclusion. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. So three years old, your, your parents took you to Germany. Yes. What do you remember leaving Ghana at that time, if you, if you do remember anything at all? So I see the pictures. I'm a daddy's girl. <laughs> so um, I, when I see the pictures, I remember um, every time going to um, Labadi Beach, that was our highlight. Mm -hmm. And um, I have this picture with my daddy having me on his shoulders, laying on a, on a big jeep. jeep. We were living in Kwashima. So um, these are the, the memories I have. My mother also loved to tie me with like African cloth, so she would wrap some African thing around my, my chest and put on some beads on me. I was a quite cute baby. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, and I also remember, of course, my family, you know. So it's not that I went to Ghana in age of three years and I didn't come back. So then we came um, to move to Ghana. Um, Germany. No, Germany. So it's not like um, when I moved to Germany, we didn't come back. It's more like when we moved to Germany, we made sure that we saved some money and then we re um, regularly um, visit our parents. Then we regularly visit our families, you know, relatives, aunties, uncles, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, arriving in Germany at that time, being a young Ghanaian uh, girl, black. How, how was it growing up? I mean, look, there was no winter in Ghana. There's winter in Germany. There's no, uh, obviously, Caucasians here. There's Caucasians there. Um, the community is different. How did you, you know, fit into the society as a child growing up in Germany? <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned winter because looking back, I think winter was the best time because then you don't have to go out to interact with all the hard stuff. <laughs> saying it this way, but um, growing up in Germany is quite, especially when you are in a very, you know, com in, when you are growing up in a community where there are not so many other black people. So we grew up in South, I grew up in South Germany, um, in Stuttgart, Ludwigsburg, so I'm a Schwabenkind. Um, whenever I speak German, my, my friends will bully me when I'm in like Berlin or Hamburg because I have like this pieces, I, I say things differently because um, there's a different German in my tongue, on my tongue, but um, you have, you're facing challenges, you're facing ch identity challenges, you're facing challenges with um, fitting in, um, trying to be accepted. Uh, I remember in the kindergarten, um, you know, when you're going from, this, from sports class to the kindergarten, they will have like two, 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 two groups, you know, you walk around, you have like someone holding your hand. And I remember no one wanted to hold my hand. No one wanted to hold my hand. And when the first, I remember his name, Kai. <laughs> Kai, when the first Kai to hold my hand, he was always like cleaning his hand on his really? trouser because he was so scared that our, my color would get on his skin. So this is like the quite, yes, it's quite, that's, that's it, like, I don't know how it is now, or if it's getting better, and honestly saying, I, I got this kind of confidence that when I look back at this experience, it was hurtful, but it also, it's like part of my identity, I grew from it, I became stronger from it, I understand how to 
to not think, take these things too much to myself, you know. I have to reflect a lot about what, how I, I experienced childhood in, in uh, Germany. But um, yeah, kids, you know, kids are very damn mean, you know. So um, it was quite difficult as a, as a black person. There are so many memories I have um, with my, my, my black color especially, and also like fights I had with my parents because I didn't understand why I was black. <laughs> really? What do you yeah. mean by that? Yes, I, I, was, I was fighting, yes. Your parents? With my father. That why are you black? Why am I black? Why, do, why am I black? Why am I black? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And this is Germany? That, that was Germany for me. I don't know how it was with others. Other people. You know, um, if you are like in Hamburg and you have like another black fellow in your kindergarten or in your um, Grundschule, that's fine because you can build confidence, you can build relationship and you can build alliances. But if you are alone and you always have to make sure you build alliances with anyone, mm -hmm. but they always see your color and they always see like you're nasty or you're, you're different or they don't want to play with you, you're like kaka. What is kaka? Kaka. <laughs> don't know what kaka is, like poop. <laughs> Interesting. Oh wow! Yeah. I know you are laughing now, but then it was it, <coughs> it wasn't was hard. It yeah. was hard. It was hard. How did you you know? Obviously, it's an experience where it, you said it toughens you. But what else did you learn from that experiences? So, the moment where these experiences changed my mindset was when I had role models. That's why I always say role models are so important for kids. Um, I remember one of my close friends, she's living in Switzerland, her name is Tessa, shout out to Tessa if you're seeing this. I always say this story because um, she really had a very huge impact on, on my identity and my confidence and her father as well. So I was in her house and I saw this paper, this um, magazine and her father was on the cover and I was like wow. And she also shared a story like how he had to restart um, from a black country coming to Switzerland and as a minority. And he was walking on the street on construction and established himself in, on a board position of one of the most important companies in Switzerland. And when she told me that, I was like, wow. And she was also sharing the story with um, how his mindset was. So he always says that when he enters the room and he knows that he's the only black person, he doesn't always see it as a disadvantage. I know we want to have diversity today, but you can't always ensure diversity. But what you can ensure that with not being in a diverse room is that everyone will remember you. So he said whenever he enters the room and he knows that he's the only black man, he takes it as, as an advantage. So now it is up to you, or up to him, on how he made that memory last. So um, make that memory last perfect. You can mm. speak eloquent, make people laugh, be happy, dress properly. You don't have to fit into that mindset or frame that they or the perception that they might have from you. Give them a different perception as a black person that they would not expect so that they will be like, oh, oh, you see. So this is how I switched and it was in my early 20s. Like I was, I think I was even still a teenager where I used, I transitioned this mindset of, okay, I'm the only black person. That is an advantage, you know, and if we have, more black people in a room that is even a better advantage and now we can show that we have something we can bring to the table and we don't have to fit into this childhood memories this victim role that we experience we have to step on it and, and show that we are better than that mm. i like that you mentioned your parents well you you saw what that did to you the discrimination um, the, the the you know your classmates who is a caucasian not holding your hands because he thinks your, you would stick to, your color would stick to her hands. That is what happened to you and what you experienced. What do you, do you see in your parents' life that was affected because they were black? Did you see anything affect their life just because they were from Africa and they were black? Yes, 
So, you know, the thing is also my first one, so I got everything, all, all the experience, you know, my, my, my twin, my brothers are twins, the last ones are twins, they have 10 years difference, and their life is mwah, sweet, the sweets. <laughs> <They're good. laughs> my parents are so relaxed, they, they fight against people that are not um, respecting my brothers, they fight against unrighteousness, you know, but back then, they always had to make sure we fit in. So I remember mm -hmm. another incident. Um, at school, I had my one blonde girlfriend, and I know that her family, like her grandma and her mother, didn't like me that much. They didn't like mm -hmm. her playing with me. And um, I, I can remember that is, or I think, I can't, I don't know, I don't have evidence if that really happened, but you know if you have that feeling that this what this kind of grandparents will be like, when Gloria touches you, tell me. Don't let Gloria to touch you. Don't let Gloria to do this and this and this with you. So we had this, we were playing as kids in the, in the, in the break at school, and everyone was just pushing each other, and I pushed her, and then she overreacted, and she went to her grandparents, finally saying that, Gloria did something. Though everyone did something, but Gloria did something. And the next moment, they rang on my bell. <laughs> and yeah, the mother came, told my mom that, yes, your daughter pushed my daughter, you know, this Karen vibes, um, victim role. And my mother was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, fitting in, not standing up for the daughter. Why would she, what did your daughter do? But she didn't know at that time, and, um, and that's okay because you have to grow into parentship. You know, now they are doing it; they are doing an excellent job, and I love my parents. But back then, because she was so afraid that I would mess up and I'll, I'll, I'll put a bad light on, on the black family in that district that we were living, the door closed. My mother took a scissors and cut my hair off. Really? She cut the whole hair off. She was like. If you don't, like she was, you know that, that thing you have in African schools, you have to take your, you have to focus on your books. So don't make friends, just focus on your books. Don't look too pretty. If you have too much prettiness, you will be too, you don't, you don't respect if you are looking good. You know, you are too confident. So humble yourself and look at the books. So she cut that hair off and she didn't even cut it. I just had like, um, like some messy. braids, you know. So she just met, she just cut the braids off. And so, and that's how I went to school the next day. What did that do to you? I was crying. I was sad. I was very sad. And I was, and I looked at that girl and I was like, see what happened because you snitched on me, which was not even like, I didn't even do anything to you. And, you know, blonde girl, they just roll their eyes and then they leave. And I was in the washroom looking at my, myself in the mirror and I was like, wow. But I had to move on. I had to still go to school. You know, I still went to school. I just did the best out of it. And that's Interesting. It. Yeah. This is a very touching story. And I know several, you know, people might have, right, been through the same thing, or maybe not. Maybe some other people had it good. But what would you say Germany as a country, right, added to your life that otherwise growing up in Ghana you might not be able to? That's a very good question. What Germany added to my life? Mm -hmm. So what I believe that Germany added to my life is this whole thing about knowing what you're talking about. You know, Germans like to know what they're talking about before they even open their mouth. You know, I can see that also in my entrepreneurial journey um, the, quite, the way we are building our company, comp the way we are building our company, we are making sure that we know what we are talking about. This, this, the, 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 the thing about the detail, you know, and um, knowing how people look at you when you're in a minority, and not being, not, not limiting yourself onto that. Like, it also gives me some, some level of confidence as well. Um, 
I think I will come back to this question again, but I have a feeling that there is something that I would like to add, but I, it doesn't come to my mind yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, let, let's speak about, um, let's say your journey in Germany to you becoming a model, to you having to you know, embrace fashion completely, and then you evolving into becoming who you are. Walk me through that transition you know, one more time. Pardon? You, mm -hmm. being a fashion user, you work for brands like Shein, you've worked for brands like Fashion Nova. I want you to speak to me on that, you know, that trajectory one more time. Um, so you want me to speak about um, the transition, like mm -hmm. my journey. Mm -hmm. So my journey, as I mentioned, it started with, fish, with the fitness and my friends were like, you know, the fitness thing, it doesn't catch us too much. We want to see how the clothes look on the body. So we want to see like the, the, the actual outcome. So I was like, okay, let me show you how the clothes look on my body because I do fitness. Mm -hmm. That's how I transitioned into fitness, uh, into fashion. And uh, what year were you? How old were you then? I think that was 2019. 2019? Yeah. Okay, so you took fashion seriously in 2019? Yeah, 2019. That's almost pandemic or before pandemic? Before pandemic. Before 2018, pandemic. 2019, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's when I was, I took every Saturday, Sunday, I, I grabbed a friend, we, we packed our clothes, we, we, I had a car, I was driving around, we took our pictures, and then throughout the week we had like every day one picture to post that's how i started and it was good like it was increasing i had my momentum my pictures went viral was it profitable were you making money i was making money but the thing about being a black influencer again is back then um, so i stepped out of this game but back then the payment and i know that there was rumors and i always like to step away from this victim role but I also felt like, why is this girl getting paid and my payment was like less? Or I had to fulfill more requirements to even get paid. So there was this difference between how fashion brands actually treat you as a black influencer. Um, that's what I experienced. Um, so with that, um, I continue with my journey. I traveled a lot. I had a lot of, I was very much in the scene, you know, um, but somehow I didn't f felt fulfilled, especially because um, I feel like when you, back then, um, if you are like having followers and you're looking pretty, people forget that you're smart. People forget <laughs> that you, <laughs> you have something in your mind and you have a vision and you want to build stuff, you know. So, and, and this like, this thing really got to me. I, I, I wasn't happy with that. And I remember I had one of my, a close Fashion Nova friend, or let's say Instagram friend, you know, we have this Instagram friendships, social media friendships. And we were talking every day. And I told her, you know what, I want to study. And she was like, oh no, that's so, don't study, that's so boring. I was like, no, let's, I want to study. I can still do this social media thing on, on the side. You know, when I have break, I'll just travel, I'll come and visit you, you know. Just saying, oh, that's so boring. Da, 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 mm -hmm. And however, fast forward, I, I'm, I'm almost done with my studies. I, um, I'm involved in two startups that are looking to be very successful, being part of a system. And um, I'm still having the followers, you know, it's, though it's not like consistent, it's still there. And somehow the community even witnessed the transition. They've been supporting me with my businesses. So sometimes they'll send me like contacts. Oh, here, this is something that can support you. Or I have this idea that can uh, support you. There's a contact that I can support you. And she became, um, she's still in the game. She also still in social media. And she also increased in her career um, on YouTube, but like her content was, was not something that I wanted to be involved with. Mm. So I'm quite happy that our way split. I respect her on what she achieved mm -hmm. and what she, she's doing now. She's very successful. She's making hella money, but not with the respect that I want to, I want to be mm. seen. Interesting. To see. So this is how um, my, my, my journey is. Mm -hmm. has become yeah was this person black too no she was a, not black she's white yes interesting yeah interesting now you know you you've been developing a passion to help support black owned businesses um obviously 
I want to ask, what is the trigger point for you? Obviously, you could have chose any other industry um, to focus on, but you chose specifically black. I mean, you, you, in the beginning of the conversation, you elaborated a little bit why, but I want us to deep dive um, the you know, disadvantage that black businesses in Germany actually have, why it became very important for you to double down on, on, on supporting black businesses. Yes, mm -hmm. that's a good question. You see, I noticed the challenges as being a black founder while being a black founder, and then I was already involved in that in, um, in idea. So, idea came before my startup mindset. Some, the initiator of um, idea reached out to me on LinkedIn. Hey, I like you, your profile, do, do, do. I want, we want to do this and this, let's connect. I was like, yes, an opportunity, let's do it. I like opportunity, I like building stuff, but I didn't know what a startup was. Mm. Back then, I was in the courts, back and forth. They gave me tasks. I didn't understand what that was. I, I, I didn't know anything about startup. I knew that we wanted to do something big and support entrepreneurship, but I didn't know what entrepreneurship was. And I know that a lot of people listening right now might even feel the same way, mm. because that's how you actually touch on the first contacts with entrepreneurship. You first don't know what it is. You think it's like a, a lash brand, or you might think that it's like a nail um, business. Like startup building innovation is actually solving problems. And this is where I noticed, I noticed that when I started Comezo. So I started Comezo simultaneously um, in a, um, at university, you know, so universities mostly in Germany at least have um, entrepreneurial scale, landscapes where they support their mindset and give them resources, network, just as how Facebook became so successful because they started at university, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's like the mindset they're quite um, supporting with mm -hmm. students. Solving my problem, I noticed that I didn't have the, the attention and the resources that I needed. And I also felt intimidated because... Why? I was standing, I remember I was standing in front of 100 people pitching and I had a blackout. And I had a blackout because I, I was feeling intimidated, I was feeling... Anxiety? I anxiety. And I didn't know where it came from because I didn't have the circle behind me giving me that confidence what was needed to exceed succeed what do you mean by journey. the circle your parents were not supporting you my parents were supporting me but i mean like with circle i mean like it, it does something to you when you have a community for example with idea black people supporting entrepreneurship they're just cheering you up they're just like oh that's so good you know exchanging um knowledges exchange supporting you mentally you see so i didn't i now before i was having that i was building my entrepreneur mindset the puzzles were clicking later, like now today when I'm on stage, and even when I'm standing before only white people, white men, I'm okay with that because I come from, from a circle and know where I'm coming from. But if you are starting an innovation, you're solving a problem, and you're solving a problem, you're addressing the problem to people that don't understand the problem. And that is why idea matters, because we are providing um, like a safe space for innovation um, in, in our community that might not be totally understood from other startup ecosystems. So how I, my experience was like, we, we applied to a lot of incubator programs, programs that are supposed to support your in, in, um, entrepreneurial journey, you know, and every time we address a problem, people would be like, why would you send money to Africa? Hmm. Because Germans don't send money to Africa. They don't yeah. send money, they don't have this mentality of, sending money like that, like how we do when you earn more money and you hear somebody is sick, you send money. They don't have this kind of mentality and they don't understand why there is a problem if you send it and they might misuse it or they don't understand when, um, why, why this whole Western Union money grant, they don't even know what that is, mm. you see. So this was the ecosystem we started with at the beginning and um, we noticed like after we completed the program, we didn't got further, but they would come to us telling us, so sorry that you didn't, you didn't got far, but honestly saying, you changed our mindset. 
we change the way we can see like different communities open different target have different target groups have different problems have different markets and we we have to shift that and imagine every black entrepreneur solving a community problem mm -hmm. has to go through the similar challenge mm -hmm. or every black per, um, entrepreneur um, finding a different market. So uh, another um, example we have, we have this black founder in our last cohort and um, she w is building, you know, this plastic hair I'm wearing, the synthetic hair, it's actually not healthy for my scalp, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I have to I'll take it off and I'll throw it away and it's plastic. So it doesn't cir circle around in the environment. But she invented a plant-based hair texture. I will braid it into my hair. It is healthy for my scalp. And when I want to take it off, I can even put it into the washing machine. And you reuse it, you see. It reduces plastic waste. So this kind of problem, who is the market? Mm. We are the market. Black ladies are the market. So imagine she's pitching it to, and pitch competitions, mostly you pitch it to people mm -hmm. that are not like in Germany not everyone knew why you, you were you were um, braids mm -hmm. you know they don't understand these challenges they don't understand why would you why a black person always they don't even know how many times we change our braids you see so that's why we need idea for innovations like this targeting different mm -hmm. market opportunities that coming from a different perspective and supporting the entrepreneurs with the resources they need to, um, to execute their vision. Mm -hmm. Let's speak more on the challenges that black businesses or even black people face in Germany as a whole. Obviously, I don't want you to speak on the global agenda because you might not have an experience, but if you do, um, you can also add that to the experiences black people are having in Germany. So I can, I can even add the perspective as a black female founder. I remember when I was, I was in UK pitching my innovation, telling them how far we got as a team, how much impact we had on healthcare access, critical and preventive access to healthcare in Ghana. And the first question in London, it was a room full of white people, only one other black lady was there. But the first question was, how would you make that possible as a black woman? Mm -hmm. Why do you think you asked that question? Why they ask me that question? Because they don't see role models like that. Interesting. You see? So, um, in that moment, I was like, I grew up in Germany. There are less black people in Germany than in the UK, especially where I grew up from. So. I don't take it as a disadvantage, I take it as an opportunity, you see. So um, I didn't enter too much into the victim role, but looking back at it, uh, my first question should have been, is this all you see, mm. you see? Mm. But um, yes, and another incident I swear that happened was, um, I was invited for an interview um, mm. with um, high quality people and then people that, that I ring the bell and I open the door and I was like mm -hmm. I never thought this would actually happen mm -hmm. or I expect that would happen mm -hmm. but when the, I was invited as a founder and I opened the door and they were like oh are you the makeup artist <laughs> I was like mm. <laughs> yeah so this is the quite this is the challenges that you um, you might experience as a female black founder um, in Germany, but I, I, what, what I advise is not to take it too deep, to talk about it, you know, because only because I'm talking about it, others will get aware of it and then pay attention up on the next time when they get into this situation to not be having this kind of situation again. Um, but in general, my experience has always been um, very positive because I have good co-founders that support me mentally and also like brief me and coach me on situations that might happen and you know entrepreneurial journey is is it's not a sprint it's a it's a marathon that's what we always say so even you know in a marathon you have moments where you have very very 
deep moments and you don't know what to do or you, you, you get into a situation that really affects you, it's the next step that you take that actually make sure, make sure that you evolve mm. with what you want to build. Mm. So th that's what I could say. Yeah. You said blackout. Do you mean you fainted or you don't remember what you said on the stage? I don't know. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what I was saying at stage. So how I, comp how I will compromise it today when I don't know what I say and my team always laugh at me because then they know that I don't know what I'm saying. I like to talk, so I just talk. I can just talk. I got this question last, I can't remember the question. Okay, forget about mm -hmm. it. But um, when you ask me a question and I don't know the answers, I can make the answer, I can puzzle the answer somehow <laughs> that it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Your, your story is very um, interesting and I know it will inspire a young one coming up. But um, I've watched you become a model. You know, there's a picture you took here in Ghana that went around a bit. Um, it went very viral. Um, is that one of the reasons why Ghana started, at what point do you feel like Ghana started pulling you small, small? Yeah, that's back picture. That yeah? picture. That picture. That picture. Speak to me about it. That was the Aqua Safari picture, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember I was working with my ex-boyfriend in mm -hmm. Accra Safari mm -hmm. and I was quite feeling shy because everyone was looking at me. I was like, why is everyone looking at me? And I wore that Kente bikini. It had this, um, this I don't know if it's strings or like, yeah, you know, strings. strings. Mm -hmm. And then I had a gold um, chain on my hips and I wear my shades, full face makeup and um, the wig, the long wig. In my bag. I see that picture so often that I can, I still have it in my eye. Um, and I was walking, everyone was looking at me, I felt quite embarrassed, I don't know why they were looking at me, so I was on my phone, minding my business, because I don't want anyone to like, you know, I don't want to look at women that they'll feel um, intimidated. You know, I'm a very open lady, like when I see a good, a good looking lady, I'll be like, oh, you look good, you know, um, but at the first, the first sight, no, no one would know. So I know that that picture was taken. And then when I got back home, so the, the photographer sent me the picture. And my ex-boyfriend was like, oh my god, that's a beautiful picture. You have to post it. I was like, that's such an ugly picture. I'm not going mm -hmm. to post it. I didn't want it to post it. Mm -hmm. He actually encouraged me to post it. And that's how it started. Like, it went viral. Like, People were posting it back to back to back to back to back. Like that was a very interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Did that did anything to your confidence at all after being looked at as inferior in Germany, and now you are on the press in Ghana, and everybody's sharing your story? You know, the thing is about social media. Mm -hmm. When you get attention and the the credits, let's say that the currency is the likes, the interaction, the comments you know you like money you know so you, you like currency as well you like to see numbers you like to see big numbers and if you if you are able to influence that you can get more numbers and more it gets you quite addicted yep so it did something to me of course you know i was somebody i became somebody after what i told you of my childhood of my my youth you know always being in minority not looking at I was finally pretty. I was somebody mm -hmm. that people admired, and um, it gave me it gave me a boost, you know. So I I I got some. So that's why I was like when you mentioned that you met me back then. I, I was so close to Asi. Were I bougie? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not bougie. Maybe I mm -hmm. maybe I was. No, no, you were you were quite open and friendly. I was okay. I yeah. was quite friendly, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, to me. To, uh, yes, that's yeah. how I am. Yeah. You see, like I always like to be humble because I know mm -hmm. where I'm coming from, you know, and I know how females or others feel when when they when nobody's. But mm -hmm. I ex like I love to take. I love to enjoy it. That was it, yeah. I love to be on the hip parties. I was able to have tables as a woman. I was able to invite my friends to my table. Uh, explain festivals. what that means. Pardon? Explain what that means. What that means, mm -hmm. like you can, you go to a club, the club invites you to 
to to their table and you have your own oh, table you see okay. and then you say come my friends are coming because normally you no know, females go on male table right. they'll join tables mm -hmm. but i was able to have my table interesting you see? so this was what changed in 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 my life and um yeah and i had a lot of fe lot of small girls um <laughs> reaching out to me that they want to be like me. I inspired them. I, every time at school, they'll have my, my pictures in, in their break, showing each other. Like, I hear those stories. I hear them a lot. So I, I was quite influential mm. on, on, on um, young females. Mm. And I like that, um, though I was that influential, that today they're still taking me as um, um, example and most of them are very entrepreneurial as well so one of my let's say closest fans mm -hmm. um, she has a whole nail business like a whole saloon mm -hmm. I think she's opening another one and easily gone mm. and every time she would be like and I remember the first time I posted on my story looking for a nail tech and she reached out randomly not expecting that I would respond and I responded and she was like and it was a Sunday, she was closed. She ran from home, mm. opened that nail saloon to get my toes done. Mm. And she was shaking. She was, oh my God, oh Emma, Emma, I'm so happy to see you. I love you so much. Okay, okay. She didn't even <laughs> want me to pay. I was like, no, like, she was so adorable. And mm -hmm. from, she was starting as someone working in a saloon, having her own saloon now and telling me whenever I see her, she, she would be telling me that how much I, I empowered her, you know, how, how she, she also wants to be somebody, you know, like she's dreaming of big things, hmm. bigger than mine, she's being of, dreaming of big cars, you know. Interesting. You see, like this is, it gives me joy, it hmm. gives me joy. Hmm. Yeah. So looking at you experiencing that, people telling you how amazing you are, and then having flashback of the guy not holding your hands as a child, <laughs> what, what does, that, that doesn't click any bell to you? So what, sometimes what I do, I don't know why, but I always have the names of these people in my mind. So I, I can still remember the, the hardest experience, the people that ha, had a, ha, um, gave mm -hmm. me the worst Bad experience, experiences. Yeah, right? I still have their names so I can check up on them. Interesting. <laughs> so do they, do they see what you have going on right now? How do they react to it if they see it? Um, Yes, they are seeing it. I remember also one girl reaching out to me uh, when I started my Instagram. She was like, so what are you doing this for? What, what is this? Does not make sense? The, back then at school, mm -hmm. then f like just last year, she reached out to me again. Wow, Gloria, that's very impressive. Like this journey, I'm, wow. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm not, I'm not taking my heart up there. I'm just like, yes. Thank you. How are you doing? How, how is everything with you? I'm happy to, that you reach out to me, you see. So mm -hmm. it doesn't do anything to me. I'm not doing it to prove anyone. It's mm -hmm. part of life, you know. Mm -hmm. Others have their other packages to carry. My package is this. But I'm not going to take that as mm -hmm. a, an angle, as a feel to, to show them. I'm not mm. showing anybody. I'm, I just want to, I like, I want to build a good company. I want to build a company that have influence, that is a part of a system and that can help people, that can change access to healthcare, that can change how um, entrepreneurs in, in, that are black access financing mm. or resources, you know, mm. that I, I want to build something. I don't want to show anybody, you see. So I that's like why that. I'm, um, I'm okay. When, when you come, reach out to me and you are mean, that's fine. Reach out to me. We can still talk. We don't have to be friends, okay? But I, I respect you and as long as you respect me, we are fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see you spending most of your time in Ghana um, these few years. How's the experience been like here in Ghana for you so far? Hot. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot. It's a hot um, experience. So, so when you put on makeup, I, I'm an athlete, so I sweat quickly. So everything, no, wait, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Mm -hmm. um, how is the experience? In Ghana, there's every time something going on mm -hmm. and everybody's doing something. And everybody's involved in something big. So you have to make sure you focus. 
you have to make sure that what you are doing contributes to the next step that you want to achieve. So don't get distracted. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, either I'm at home having a full day of meetings um, or I am out there having a full day of meetings. So even me right now, I have to go to another meeting. <laughs> um, and you have to make sure you build relationship because mm -hmm. people forget, you know. So especially when you come from the diaspora, I don't like telling people when I'm back or when I'm going because I'm here, mm. okay? So when, even when you said, are you there tomorrow? I can make sure that I'm there tomorrow, you see? But um, just make sure you are catching up on the relationships that you're having. In between, mm. you're not there. Mm. Else, it will look like you are coming and then you need something and then you are going and you, are, you, are, you don't exist. Mm. I like to follow up on my especially important stakeholders uh, and build relationships with them because they're like building business if you do it alone you can go fast and it's also something that i experienced as an influencer i was a, like i was very alone i was one of the first in my circle that became this um, social media atten attention and then it saturated so i didn't have allies connections with other influencers that it could, was able to grow big so somehow it saturated so you have to do corporations, you have to do collaborations, because mm -hmm. if you go f together, mm -hmm. you can go fast. So that also comes with business. You can mm -hmm. build your own business by yourself and say you don't need help, you don't need help. But you eventually, mm -hmm. to make sure that it's a sustainable business that can scale, you have to connect with others. Mm -hmm. They will bring their network, you bring your network, you mm -hmm. put benefit in their business, they will put benefit in your business, mm -hmm. so that it can be something you know, big. Mm -hmm. So you, that's, you have to, you have to work on it mm -hmm. while you're building relationship mm -hmm. and making sure you check up on and mm -hmm. in between. What do you like about Ghana? <sighs> what I like about Ghana? So I like about Ghana that we are very open. We are very, in, we do like doing things but we also like to enjoy. We like, we like to take things easy. We like to have entertainment and fashion. We love beautiful things. Um, we love music. That's what I like about it. And we have a lot of pride. You know, when we, are, when we are out there in Ghana, we know that we show that we are Ghanaians. We see a Ghanaian Janami necklace. You see us buying it, especially diaspora. We love buying. We love being, being connected with the cultural part and it is okay to embrace it. This is what I love the most about Ghana. Mm. I interviewed a young woman and she says Ghana bring her peace. Ghana is her peace. How do you feel when you're in Ghana? Do you feel more peaceful than you were in, in Germany? Hmm. I understand where she's coming from when, when you come here and you want peace because in Germany you have it's just work and 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 paying bills. <laughs> it is true, but I, I wouldn't say, from my perspective, it's not like that because I have so much on my head that I want to execute. So I just want, I'm happy. When, I, when I'm in Ghana, I'm pushing things. I'm pushing things. I want to make sure we are, we are executing, we are moving forward. And because maybe when I'm calling my Uber and the Uber is delaying, and, or they'll call me, uh, where are you going, okay? Um, I cannot feel peace because the infrastructure is not as smooth as how in different countries when you're doing business it would go. So from a business perspective, you have to push more, but when it comes to enjoyment, Ghana loves enjoyment. So that mm. is the peaceful side, mm -hmm. I, I suggest, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I know you, you've ventured into corporate, you're doing your thing, being an, <laughs> a CEO co-founder, but let's speak about the night's life a bit. <laughs> in, in Ghana, if you don't mind. Yeah, we can speak. I don't know what to tell you about. <laughs> so I know the clubs, though. I know the clubs, I, but I'm bad with names. So when they say they're going front back, I don't even know which area that front back is. Mm. So I know where Republic is. Republic is in Osu, yeah. Mm. They have How was your experience in the nightlife here in, in Ghana? Uh, uh, and December is coming, bear in mind. Yes, December is coming, but I'm hiding. You don't see me out there. Yeah. The thing is, you have to, I, am, I don't even know how to say it. So I just don't want 
to look like another diaspora that wants to do business and comes in December and go back in January. That's why I don't want to be too much involved in this party party scene because then I look like I'm coming in December. I remember one of my um, artist friends I have, he was like, ah, oh, you're doing business in December. Okay, then it's not really business. Mm. You see, so um, that's why, how, why I'm not too. I'm not too. When when they're like, oh, we are going out. Da, 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 I'm not too the pipe, and I don't like noise. Mm. I have so. My, are, you, are you trying to say we will not see you outside in December? <laughs> because I'll be having cameras out there, and I'll bring evidence. <laughs> <laughs> if you have cameras, then tag me. But one thing I like about Ghana is everybody. You meet the entrepreneurs. I was in a lounge with a billionaire. And these are people who work around the clock 24 7 and in December you get to relax you know you get to be just nobody just just be yourself um, have a great time and for the Ash Prince obviously we even Ghanaians we do the same we just let ourselves you know go go out there and have fun but somehow for the Ash Prince we kind of criticize you a bit all you're doing is just coming to party there's nothing wrong with that um, and I think I was saying this you, you can disagree the best networks are in December mm. because everybody who knows everybody is in Ghana at that time. And I, I always tell people, you do yourself a disjustice um, if you don't put yourself out there. I understand, but everybody also is a somebody, becomes a somebody around December. So you have to filter who's actually a somebody that Well, can... true, but there's something we say in Ghana that meaning the foreigner is the one who eats the chicken that is blind, mm. meaning you don't know what it is. We can see through the chaff, right? So we, we see the, the, the fake ones and we see the wrong ones. But anyways, you say you're not going to be out there. You oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, now, maybe, you, maybe you convinced me now. I'll be around with you then. You sure. can filter it for me. Sure. We are having a great conversation. Yes, right. I think the audience would agree, uh, you know, together with me, you've come a very long way, transitioned from being um, a fashion model influencer to actually being a corporate and being a founder and solving real problems. Um, look, I advocate, you know, what I do on this channel is to encourage um, diasporans to relocate, you know, to come to Africa, take advantage of the opportunities because it's an emerging market. There's so, there's plenty of problems here and so as opportunities. So I encourage people to at least visit, um, uh, you know, to invest in, in, into the continent and whatnot. You are doing that by, you know, your uh, FinTech what would you say to fellow friends, diasporans, fellow Germans, black Germans who have been here for years and don't even want to look back? Um, some people have interviewed and said, listen, when I tell my parents that I want to come back to Africa, they're asking me, why? What are you going to do there? But these are obviously brains, intelligence that can be, you know, you know be helping us in Ghana grow. If you have a message for people like this, what would that message be? So the only message that comes to my mind is, just start, okay? So if you have something in your mind that you want to do as abstract as it is, just make sure you start and take that opportunity. And um, I, I also just started. I started with nothing, not knowing how it, to even reach these healthcare providers locally. And eventually, um, what I always tell to everyone that starts, I always tell them you have the keys in the hand for every door you want to open in your life. So take that keys and open the door and make sure you can fulfill the vision that you have in your mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, look, I encourage people to move back. Um, with that being said, I've interviewed thousands behind cameras of diasporans relocating. And on camera, maybe about 150 to 200 people in diasporans. And listen, I've heard their experiences. I know, you know, they're actually on ground building businesses. I know what to do, what not to do. With that being said, I want to be able to help you guys in diaspora transition. I don't, I don't say move back completely. I want you to visit. Um, I, I'm, we are open. We do, we do have a tour company now called Web Nation Travel and Tour where we dedicate our time, our team, into you know, creating experiences that would leave uh, memories that would be hard to you know, forget. Uh, we work with groups. We do have uh, about 14 groups coming in December from the 26th to the 3rd of January. These are students. You are, you know, a group, you want to come to Africa, Ghana, you need someone on ground to, you know, take care of logistics, uh, plan your trip, you know. I've enjoyed, you know, our conversation. It's, it's inspiring, your story. 
if you do have anything to add to you know what we've had, you know, what would that be? If I didn't mention. Um, so what I would like to tap on briefly is that you know when you are a diaspora founder, there are also institutions that support you with these opportunities that or the visions that you have in mind. So um, as for Comezo, we we were supported by the Western Union Foundation, as you mentioned. Um, we are also supported by the GIZ, and maybe there is something out there that you want to build in your country, and there are organizations and institutions that can support you on how to either relocate or even um, support you with financing so that you can start your business in Ghana. So look out there, um, do your research, start and also connect yourself so you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, on Instagram as well and I can give you advice on that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys, where we are currently from is called Jendu Place. Jendu Place is a co-working space located in East Legon, very close to American House. Uh, you're a diaspora, uh, you work remotely, you want somewhere with high speed internet to be able to plug and play, Jendu Place is a place for you. Even as a content creator, you want a studio to record your podcast, you don't have equipment, you, have, you don't have a camera. They have everything here. All you need to do is just walk in with your guest or whatever show you have going on and they just press record, edit everything and give it to you. Uh, it makes it easier for you to become a content creator. So make sure you check it out. And uh, remember, we are going to Zanzibar on the 11th of November to 17th. Uh, this is a luxury experience. Um, you have 14 people, 14 slots available. Um, it's already getting booked. You don't want to miss out. This is a private experience, luxury experience, elite. You know, there's, you know, yash involved, there's private jets involved, great experiences. And, uh, you know, connecting with entrepreneurs on ground um, who relocated from the diaspora and actually doing it on ground. You can get to meet them in person, listen to their experiences and advice that they have for you. And uh, before you know it, you might be the next um, entrepreneur on ground doing great things. And, uh, yeah, you know, be part of it. Link in the description, uh, reach out to us and book your seat now before it's too late. So, thank you so much for talking to me. Uh, I appreciate you for coming. We've had a great conversation. Um, without further ado, let's just say bye bye to the people who tune in to enjoy the conversation. All right. Peace. Bye. <laughs>